So now, let's look at the second big test that the last day's church will be taken through. And I call it Big Test B, titled The Lunatic, subtitled Discernment. I saw two people that I know in my neighborhood. Or I knew in my neighborhood. One of these two people is a respectable auto mechanic. We can call him by the name King. And the other person is a noble looking young man who is a lunatic. Both men were involved in a quarrel, an altercation, and really it was King that was having the altercation with the lunatic. So the lunatic, we're going to call him Emmanuel. And the uh, auto mechanic, we're going to call King. I watched in amazement as King began to get confrontational with Emmanuel the lunatic to the point that he was being held back by other witnesses. King was being held back by other witnesses. I asked one of the observers if King did not know that he was dealing with a lunatic. I was expecting King to have been rational and discerning that he was having an argument with a demon-possessed man. But he had been provoked by some foul words spoken by Emmanuel the lunatic. Eventually, my respectable friend, an auto mechanic, King, got pushed into a dirty gutter. And it was a very sorry sight to behold, I'm telling you. The insane guy, King, showed power over the same man who was expected to know better. Now, the gutter King fell into was opposite a building, an institution. And on top of the institution was written, Teens Allowed. So, this gutter is directly in front of a building type that is called Teens Allowed. I got to meet King personally and I asked him if he did not know that Emmanuel was mentally unsound. That's because both of them would have walked past each other at least a few times because Emmanuel could often be found loitering around the streets close to where King's auto electric shop is. But King seemed unaware, and that was really surprising to me. Because I know King to be a spirit-filled believer, or at least that is how he comes off to me. I watched him lose his temper over the foul words Emmanuel spoke to him. I perceive that Emmanuel sought for an occasion to move against King. Since I knew Emmanuel, I explained to King that he, he, Emmanuel, could speak very foul and vulgar words. I mean, in local dialect, 
these were very obscene language that I cannot repeat. Even he could just suddenly spring up, like jump up into the air with his thumb pointed offensively to, to simulate the insult. The whole focus was King's inability to A. Discern that he was dealing with a possessed man and should not have brought himself down to that level. A level that ended up getting him into a gutter and his clothes were dirty. They became dirty and filthy. B. The, 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 another focus was that King was unable to control himself. His temper was lost despite his maturity. Which is why I was so surprised. When I say king's maturity i'm talking about a believer that has walked in the gifts of the holy spirit like hebrews chapter 6 talks about those who have left the elementary principles of christ and have pressed on to even tasting the gift of the heavenly gift and the gifts of the holy spirit and so on and so forth being partakers of the good word of god and so king falls in that category even as his name symbolizes he falls in the category of a mature spirit filled and gifted believer so here is understanding from this revelation one it was not the provocative foul words of the lunatic that brought King down into the gutter to become dirty and shamed. But it was his reaction to the provocative foul words. Because King lacked the awareness that he was dealing with an evil spirit and not flesh and blood Ephesians 6 verse 12 to 13 and 16 we are not defiled by a man's words unless we believe them and that's the connection to faith Matthew chapter 15 verse 10 to 12 King was supposed to use his shield of faith against those fiery darts that came out from the mouth of Emmanuel the lunatic but he failed to do so number two Emmanuel actually because he was demon possessed so we can say here that the demons that had possessed Emmanuel sought for an occasion to move against King but God's interest was to see if King could discern this that is why a few times I expressed shock and surprise that king could not identify the mental condition of the lunatic first peter 5 verse 8 reads it this way it says be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour verse 9 says whom resist steadfast like resist him steadfastly in the faith 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So what Peter was saying here to us, the church, is that we need to be sober and vigilant because at any point in time you might meet somebody. How do you see the devil? He is a spirit, so he works through human beings. And at any point in time you may meet somebody who is actually going to be influenced by the devil to say something or to do something to you and I. And when that happens, Peter is admonishing us by the, by the Spirit of God that the devil is as a, he's not a, but he's as a, in other words, he mimics a roaring lion and walks about seeking whom he may devour. So remember I said Emmanuel sought for an occasion to move against King. This was the understanding that the Holy Spirit gave to me in the revelation. Now it's important to stay here that all of the dreams, the prophetic visions that I had in this one night, I was given the interpretation of each of them, just as John the Revelator, when he was caught up into the heavens, was given the interpretation of the visions. I was given the interpretation, so I didn't have to try to un understand it by my own knowledge, sit down and try to, I just understood it. I understood what each of the symbols meant and I understood what the tests were and I had the voice of God with me speaking to me audibly. Number three, King lost his temper, to say the least, over the foul words because of the condition of his heart. To believe those words and thus they have power to influence his actions. It's important to really meditate on this because God was testing King and God's interest was to see if King could discern this. Remember this was number two. But King lost his temper over the foul words because of the condition of his heart. What was the condition of his heart? King had not yet matured or was not yet walking in spirit to be sensitive enough to discern that the person he was dealing with was demon possessed. So he was actually not talking to a person, but he was talking to the demon or the demons were talking to him. And being able to rightly separate the, the demon from the person is what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 emphasizes. That the word of God is, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's quick and it is powerful. It's active and is able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's able to separate spirit from soul and from flesh. So King failed to discern. And he believed rather those words. And because he believed those words had power, they actually influenced his actions. Those foul words were like the fiery darts of the wicked one. Ephesians 6 verse 16. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So fear also comes by hearing and hearing the words of the devil. So Jesus Christ said to the multitude in Matthew chapter 15 and 10, Hear and understand. Number four. The last day's prophetic church will need to be guarded against what we hear and how we hear. Because it can either be words to steal what is in our hearts or words to increase our faith. We need to take heed of the fact and reality of spiritual warfare and how words can be likened to fiery darts when coming out of the mouth of a demon-possessed man. In particular, such words inflame and attempt to make us lose our self-control. 
Jesus Christ believed in his heart that Pilate had no authority over him. Neither the high priest nor the soldiers. So when questioned, he kept the, the shield of faith above all, holding fast to his peace and speaking only as the father within demanded him to, expressing his faith over the circumstance he found himself in for the scriptures to be fulfilled. Matthew chapter 26 verse 48 to 66 Matthew chapter 27 verse 11 to 14 John chapter 19 verse 6 to 12 Jesus Christ held fast to his faith. We, his body and his brethren must do same to pass this test of discernment that God the Father has prepared for the last days prophetic church. Number five, King's behavior brought his reputation to the gutter even making him come off as immature just as teenagers are the ones expected to act noisily in public or rowdily. King acted childishly because adults are least expected to get into a brawl over words. This is a big challenge to the last day's church remember in the vision there was a building in front of the gutter that king fell into and on top of the building was written teens allowed so god was making a big statement setting up this prophetic vision that way so paul wrote in first corinthians chapter 13 verse 11 when i was a child i spoke as a child i understood as a child I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Many of us are still like King, and God is calling us to perfection or maturity. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. Number 6. The last day's church is a prophetic church because it must live by the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of prophecy. Many times, denominations that are not awoken to the prophetic, when you hear the word prophetic, they shy away. But listen, to be prophetic simply means to live by the Spirit of the Lord. The spirit of prophecy is to live by the word of God, living word of God, not just the written word, but the living word. Your conscience is speaking to you. Your intuition is speaking to you. You're hearing the voice of God in your spirit while you're meditating the scriptures in your heart. God is speaking to you. You have, you have convictions on a daily basis. You are having dreams. You're having revelations, visions, and so on and so forth so the last days church must function by revelation knowing that which the natural eyes cannot see it must be awoken from the letter to have life and be able to discern spirits and discern good and evil Remember what Jesus said in the scriptures in the book of John. Jesus said, such the scriptures. He was speaking to Pharisees and scribes. He said, such the scriptures. For in them, you think you have life. So Jesus was simply saying, the scriptures by themselves cannot give us life. 
because the life of God is in a person. He, he, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. That's Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, the scriptures testify of me. You wouldn't rather come to me that you would have life. So the scriptures point to a person. And so when we read the scripture, we take the Bible, we read the scriptures, we don't just end there. We take the scriptures and we pray. And when we say prayer, we are setting our hearts to approach God, who is a spirit, the living God. And then we, we approach God through the Lamb of God, Jesus.